As most of you know, the Olympics began on Friday of this week, and the Olympic light came to uh, Rio de Janeiro on Thursday and was used to light the Olympic light there at the Olympics in the opening ceremony uh, on Friday evening. And uh, it, be- it began with a ceremony lighting, a ceremonial lighting in ancient Olympia, Greece, on April the 21st and made its way to Maracana Stadium for the opening ceremony on Friday. Light is significant, and that light will burn throughout the Olympics. And Jesus made a statement that we are to be salt and light. Uh, As Jesus moved from the blessings of the kingdom that we talked about last Sunday to the responsibilities of the kingdom, Jesus calls us as his followers to be salt and light. And this refers to our influence. Uh, Christianity is not just about us or for us. It begins with our own transformation, but we have an influence on others as well. In Matthew's, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 13 to 16, it says, You are the light of the earth, but if the excuse me, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And so as as we looked last week, who wants to be blessed? Everybody wants to be blessed. And Jesus opened up with eight kind of characteristics of, of how we receive God's blessing. But that isn't the end of the story. He is now moving on. This is this is the Sermon on the Mount, the, the greatest sermon ever, and uh, that's what our, our sermon series is, uh, uh, talking about the greatest sermon. And uh, as we move on from the blessings, now's the responsibility, the influence that we are to have in this world. And we're going to look at several ways that uh, Jesus tells us that we are to influence others as believers. And this morning, we want to notice that your influence matters. The first areas that he talks about is love and hate. Love and hate. These are two words that perhaps are overused in our world today and even abused and misused. And often the very definitions of love and hate are certainly not accurate of what they really truly are. But in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And and so as he he came, he, he he was fulfilling all of the things that were in the law and prophets. And actually, the law... Uh, the, the law that he fulfilled is in, in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40, uh, when the question came, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And so Jesus in coming, he came in love. He came with God's love, not, not human love, not just emotional love, not just uh, even brotherly love of, of caring for family and close friends, but he came with the love of God and love is greater than the law. And so when, when Jesus came, he didn't say you don't have to follow the law anymore. He came and fulfilled all of that law and, and called us to a higher law. In Matthew 5.20, he says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. For now centuries since the time that uh, God gave the law to Moses, the, the religious leaders were 
adding to the law, interpreting the law, changing the law. And so they, they had a legalistic approach to the law. Well, it says this, so you have to do that. And, and there, there was not much grace in it. And so when the, when the Pharisees were teaching the law, often they taught it in a way that made them look good. They, they taught what, uh, what they were doing uh, rather than what the law is. And Jesus is saying that he has brought a greater law. It not only fulfills the law, but love expands on the law, takes it to a whole new level beyond what the law was. And he has two phrases that throughout the rest of uh, this chapter, he uses to describe the law of the Pharisees in comparison to what he was bringing in the, the law of love, loving God and loving our neighbor. And those two phrases are, you have heard that it was said. In other words, he's talking about the Old Testament law and the way that it had been taught by the scribes and Pharisees in times past, but as well in, in Jesus' day. He, he's saying, you've heard, heard it said. This was the, the popular philosophy, whether or not it was exactly the law that God gave to Moses, and many times it wasn't. But this is what you've heard. This is what you've been taught. And then Jesus says, but I tell you. And he takes the law that they were familiar with, and he says, but I tell you, this is how you should respond if you're going to be a follower of mine. Remember last week I set the introduction to the sermon series that that Jesus had begun his ministry, he had a small band of disciples, and he had gone out and began to to speak, and he was uh, providing miracles, people's uh, bodies were being healed, and there were great miracles, and so a great crowd came, and uh, Jesus noticed the crowd, and he went up on the hillside, and he sat down, which was a symbol of, of authority, and he began to teach. His disciples came to him, and the crowd was all around them. And he's saying to them, you have heard that it was said, but I tell you. And uh, so in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, we begin to see these comparisons. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to, gu- to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin, but anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of hellfire. Here we see this, this word, uh, Raka, was uh, simply a, a, a word that was used in that time to, to be an insult to people. Uh, and uh, he, he's saying, well, if you do that, you would be subject to the Sanhedrin. But I'm telling you, if you say you fool to anyone, that you will be in danger of hellfire. The, the standard of love is higher. Uh, we are not to even hold within our bosom hatred toward others. We're not to hold within our hearts anger toward others. We, we are to show love. Uh, a physician once was asked, um, what is the, the best medicines for humans? Excuse me, he, he said that. He said the best medicine for humans is love. And someone asked him then, well, what if that doesn't work? And he said, increase the dose. And, and so, you know, if we love people and they reject our love, we should just keep loving them more and more. Jesus came to fulfill the law not to abolish the law. The the comparison between love and hate, uh, not only are we not to murder, but we're not to hate. We're not to hold anger in our heart toward others, but we are to love. The second area that we want to look at is morality and integrity. Morality and, and integrity. These are not opposites, but these are two aspects of what Jesus is telling us to do. In Matthew Chapter 5, uh, verses 27 and 28, it says, You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Lust is a great problem in our culture. And, And it's a great destroyer of homes and families and relationships. I just want to read to you a rather lengthy quote here. Uh, that was in Christianity Today. It was written by Haley Gray Scott, and it's talking about pornography. And you might say, well, Pastor, why would you tell us about pornography? Uh, 
We're, we're Christians. Uh, the statistics would tell us that in a room this size, whether we're believers or not, that there are a number of people who use pornography, who watch pornography, and several that are addicted to pornography. And so I think as we look at this word lust, I think that pornography fits very well. The writer says, this spring, Utah became the first state to declare pornography a public health crisis, calling on businesses and educators to protect children from it. Around the same time, Time Magazine, a, a Time Magazine cover story reported that porn causes physical side effects in young men whose minds have marinated in X-rated clips from the time they were teenagers. Pornography trains the user to seek more extreme sexual experiences to receive the same satisfying flood of dopamine. It's what researchers call the Coolidge effect. The prospect of a new sexual partner excites males and sometimes females so much that normal sexual activity becomes boring by comparison. Time magazine focused on how porn usage prevents couples from having healthy sex lives. That's only the beginning of a troubling and growing amount of research and trends. We're learning more and more about the lasting impact of living in a world wired to a porn-saturated internet. Studies have linked porn consumption to depression and higher drug and alcohol consumption, our ability to think, reason, and make decisions. Years ago, pornography was usually in printed form, and in some way you had to buy it from behind the counter or someone that was older had to have it and then uh, share it with you or, or, or find it. But today, our young people are carrying with them links to pornography in their smartphones. And, and I just want to say to parents this morning, I'm not trying to come across as, as the old prude, but when you give your young people access to a smartphone, you are giving them access to everything that there is on the internet. And you need to give careful guidance and careful training and, and, and put up barriers to them finding these things. Sometimes it's just by accident. Uh, one time back in the 90s, uh, we were going to California for a, an anniversary trip and I uh, was looking for a baseball game. And at that time, uh, the Angels team was called the Anaheim Angels. I put Anaheim Angels in, and it came up to a porn site. And, and so we need to protect our children and young people because once those images are there, it becomes enticing, and they go back and back again. And it has very, very uh, damaging physical, spiritual, emotional, and mental side effects for people who go back time and time again to pornography. And we need to protect our children and our young people from it. And I'm not just talking to young people this morning. If you're a great-grandpa and you're watching that stuff, you shouldn't be doing it. Jesus says that we are not to be lusting after others in our hearts. In Matthew 5, verses 31 and 32, he goes on and talks about marriage and divorce. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. If you've been through a divorce, I don't have to tell you how hurtful that is. It's like ripping yourself apart. Um, you know, it, sometimes if, if you have a disease in a part of your body and it has to be surgically removed, that hurts enough. Uh, but when you experience a divorce, the Bible tells us that we have become one flesh. And rather than something being surgically removed through divorce, our lives are ripped apart. And, and no matter what our differences are, when, when we go through that divorce, part of us has been ripped from us. And, and God loves us too much to want that to happen to us. And so this isn't, again, a, a, a law of judgment. This is love. He, he is saying that we are to, to maintain our love relationships. Francis Chan wrote, Your best shot at having a beautiful marriage 
is if both of you make it your goal to become more like Jesus. And sometimes that doesn't happen. Maybe, you're, maybe you want to become more like Jesus and your spouse wants more pornography or other, other people or whatever it may be. And I, and I understand you can't control all of those things. But Jesus is telling us here that we are to keep our marriage commitment. And then ver- verses 35 to 37, it says, And again, you her- have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep the oath you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem. Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black, or to return, for that matter. Uh, Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Under the law, there were two different styles of teaching, types of teaching under two different leaders. And one it was that uh, a man could get a certificate of divorcement, a writing of divorcement for any reason or no reason at all, just whatever. You know, she burnt the toast this morning, that's the end of the marriage. And, and they, they felt that that was fine. Uh, the, other, the other one uh, said that uh, a marriage was allowed only in the case of uh, major offense. And Jesus here says that divorce was only allowed in the case of marital unfaithfulness. But this, in these verses here about taking an oath, and it talks about making an oath on God's throne or, or the earth it, 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 and its footstool or Jerusalem or parts of your body, uh, the Pharisees would use that as a, an excuse uh, to break a vow. It, it would kind of be like, you know, today when you promise somebody something and you put your hands behind your back and cross your fingers because you think that releases you from what you said. That's kind of the idea of what it was if you, you know, oh, I didn't, I didn't take that oath on, on God. I didn't take that oath to God. I, I took that oath on my head or whatever. And it was a way of getting out from underneath your word. And Jesus said, whatever oath you take, whether it is your wedding vows or whether it is a, a business commitment or whatever else it might be, when you give your children your word, when you give your spouse your word, that should be binding. Jesus is saying that our word should be our bond in every area of life. Young people, you, you may not even realize this, but there was a time in this country when two businessmen would get together and they would discuss a deal. All they had to do was shake hands, and their word was their bond. They didn't need a contract. They didn't need signatures. They didn't need a bunch of lawyers going in and trying to find out in the fine print all the different things, how you can get out of it. When they said it's a deal, it was a deal. And that's the way it should be. And that was even in the secular world at that time. That's the way a Christian should be. When we give the one standing next to us at the altar, our word, our word should be our bond. When we have a business deal, our word should be our bond. When we tell our children we're going to do something, our word should be our bond. In every area of life, our word should be our bond. The law may have loopholes to let you out of it, but love says, if I said I will do it, then I will do it. I will keep my oaths. Then the third thing is generosity and enemies. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 42, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist the evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him uh, the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, Let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. We we are to live in love, to treat others as we would have them to to, uh, love us. And so if, if, if someone is demanding something from us, we are not only to give, but we are to give beyond and then in verses 43 to, 30 to 47, 
You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. We are to love one another, even those who despitefully use us, even those who would be our enemies. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, it says, Be perfect, therefore, as your Father is perfect. And that word perfect has, has a different meaning than, than what we, we would have today in that word. It means to, to be mature, to be complete, to, to fulfill these responsibilities of the kingdom that we've read about this morning uh, take many years of growing and coming to maturity. It only takes a moment to turn your heart to Jesus and say, please forgive my sins, to repent and ask him to be your savior and to make a decision to follow him. It only takes a moment to do that. But it takes a lifetime to become a mature believer. If you're here this morning, including me, and you, and, you, and you can read these verses from the Sermon on the Mount of what Jesus has said, and, and you say, I got it. I'm there, no problem, I can do that. You need to maybe go to your prayer closet and say, Lord, just check out my heart. I'm, I'm not there. Maybe you're not there. But God wants us to go there. He wants us to be growing there, to that kind of maturity where we can love one another even as he has said for us to do. And perhaps today you're here, and again, you've never ask Jesus to be your Savior. You never decided to become a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm going to close with prayer, and in that prayer, I'm going to pray a prayer of repentance and confession. If you didn't pray earlier, uh, you can pray along in, in your heart with me now. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. And Lord, your, your standard of love is, is far beyond our human comprehension. And these words are not easy words. They're not easy words to preach and they're not easy words to live by. They're not easy words to hear. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that you would speak to our hearts and that you, you would help us to be willing to grow in your grace to the next level of, of growing toward this perfection, this maturity, this completeness, this love that, you've, that you have expressed. And perhaps there's those among us who do not know you as Savior. I pray that today, this would be the day that their life would change forever. That their eternal destiny would change when they ask Jesus to be their Savior and decide to follow him. Dear, dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I was born in sin. And I've committed acts of sin. And I confess to you that I'm a sinner. But this morning, I repent. I change my mind. I change my direction. I turn away from my sin and my sinful life, and I turn to you. And I ask you to forgive my sins and to be my Savior and to help me to walk in a new way. Rather than following after the temptations of sin, help me to follow you and to live the way you want me to live. Help me to have the love that this passage of Scripture talked about this morning. And I choose today to be your follower. Lord, I pray that you would answer that prayer in the hearts of people who prayed it this morning. And we'll give you praise and honor and glory for all that you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.